How are we? Good, all two of you. That's great. Um, just kidding. I see the rest of you. It's fine. Uh, glad that you are here with us this morning. Uh, hey, real quick, before we jump in, want to just make note of one thing that is uh, possibly new information for you today. Um, also, as an insert in your bulletin, uh, you'll find just a, a half sheet there uh, that talks about online giving. Uh, many people over the last couple years have asked us to, to get into place online giving, and so uh, we heard you, we worked through that process, and now online giving is in place. So uh, basically, um, you can go to our website, there's a give button up at the top, right-hand corner, uh, and you can go on there and you can give uh, just one time, you can set up reoccurring giving, you can set up auto-draft, however you want, it's completely safe. Uh, if you need credentials on any of that, uh, please come find me and I can get you that uh, information uh, soon. But uh, the insert there hopefully answers any questions that you have about how that process goes. And so if you have any further questions or you run into issues, please con contact us at the office during the week. Call Cheryl. Uh, she will try and answer your question. And if she cannot, then I uh, will make myself available to answer those questions. So I wanted to make you aware of that before we get started. But we're going to dive right in because we have uh, nine pages worth of stuff to go through here. So um, we, need to get, we need to get moving here. So we are looking at the life of Paul. Uh, we've been doing this for the last couple of weeks. We're talking about how God rebooted his life and rebooted his purpose, and we want to learn and have a reboot in our own lives as well. That's the whole purpose of, of this series that we're in, is looking at Paul's life and how God rebooted his life and how we can have a reboot in our lives as well. And we know that rebooting in our lives is difficult. It is hard, and, and, and we know that it's easy to get off track sometimes, it's easy to have our focus taken away from the reboot. It's easy to have our purpose uh, get distracted. And sometimes you can think that, uh, you know, we're going to go the right way, that we're on the right track, when in reality, we are not on the right track. So oftentimes, it's easy for our, our minds and our, eye, and our eyes to get distracted. A couple weeks ago, week number one, uh, when Dennis stepped in, he outlined the sigmoid curve. You remember this? In fact, we have an image. Can we throw that image up on the screen? We, ha we, have, this, we have this curve that outlines kind of the, the lifespan of businesses, the life cycle of businesses. And every about 20 years, Dennis kind of outlined this, every about 20 years, a change needs to happen to ensure that the life of that organization continues or else it just kind of tanks and it decreases. And for some, they, they peak. For some organizations, they peak out, they start heading downward, and they don't recover, and it leads to their death. And we talked about uh, a few of those that have happened. For some, they realize that they have to have a repurpose in their lives, in their businesses, or else they're going to die. And so they make sometimes fairly significant changes. And so, as you can see on this, as they are heading up, the up uh, in, in increasing in their, uh, to where they're at point A there, as they're still increasing, they, they make a change and they get on that red line that what happens? It causes them to decrease for a little bit, right? Like they're heading up, things are going good. They say, if we don't make a serious change here, we're not going to last for the long term. So they make a change and the initial response is decrease. They decrease for a little bit before they hit their second wind and they head up into curve number two. In this transition period, it can almost seem like things are going horribly for a while there. It can seem like things are going badly. It's, it's a time of doubt. It's, it's a time of uncertainty, uh, some would call it. But it leads to longer and further growth for the organization, what we see there in the red line. And when you get into this position when you're making changes, for, for some organizations, it, it means totally changing the face of the organization, totally changing what they do. You, you have to almost take on a new identity, and we've seen this throughout history. I want to I show you a couple. Let's see if you recognize a couple of these. Anybody know who this next picture is? We know who that is, right? That's Mario, right? It's me, Mario, right? It's good, right? I used to play this game all the time. Anybody play this game? couple people, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we know who Mario is, right? Mario's been around for like 30 years or, or something like that. Uh, Mario was invented by an organization called 
Nintendo, right? Remember the original Nintendo back in the day? We had one. Like, we loved it. It was great. Uh, Did you know that Nintendo was not just a video game company? You know what they did before that? They did this. Nintendo playing cards. Anybody have these? No. You didn't, probably, because you didn't know about it, right? Like, they used to produce playing cards. That was kind of their thing. Nintendo had been around, has been around for about 100 years. And the first 70 years of this organization, they made games like playing cards that nobody really bought because they didn't really know about them and they didn't do it very well. But uh, about 70 years into this, the founder's grandson took over the company. He realized that the card game was going nowhere And so, over the next 20 years, began to change the face of the company into what we now know it as a video game company. Totally changed the face of Nintendo. Totally changed their purpose. Let's do another one. Let's look at this one. Anybody have this one? Netflix? Any Netflix people out there? Right? A few more, right? How many have been doing Netflix back when it used to look like this? Anybody do that? So if you remember, back when Netflix first started, back in the early 2000s, you didn't get online and stream your content. You got online and told it what DVDs to send you in the mail, right? Anybody still do this? Anybody? Yeah, a couple people still do this, right? Like, it's still a thing. I didn't, we transitioned to the streaming thing, like, I don't even know, probably seven or eight years ago. But, but you can still get mail, uh, still get DVDs in the mail. In fact, some 2.7 million people still get DVDs sent to them in the mail. That's like 4.7% of their customers. So if that's you, congratulations, <laughs> you're in the lower 4.7%. Um, but here, here's kind of a further thing for, for Netflix. Netflix was founded in 1997. In 2007, 10 years after they started, uh, after they were founded, uh, they had sent out their one billionth DVD in the mail. In 10 years, they sent out a billion DVDs. I can't get my mind wrapped around that, right? Uh, and they began transitioning to online streaming. They knew the whole putting it in the mail thing, was not a long-term th- plan. This was not going to work for them for the long term. So they began completely changing their purpose and, and their identity, and they caught another curve. They caught that second curve, which is online streaming that they're still riding out today. But interestingly enough, in, in, in uh, 2007, when they were losing money in the mailing DVD game, they went to another major organization that does this, that does movie rentals and says, we want to sell you this part of our company. We're going to completely get out of it. We want to sell you this so that you can capitalize on it. And this other company said, no, we don't want what you've been doing. Our model is working fine. You want to guess who that other company was? Blockbuster. Anybody still go to Blockbuster? Anybody still got a Blockbuster card? Yeah, (laughs) somebody does, yeah. Yeah, they're still floating around. We all know how Blockbuster worked out, right? Like they did not last. Changing your purpose is hard. Changing your identity is hard. But sometimes changing your purpose is what it takes in order to continue on. And here's the reality. When we go through the process of changing our purpose, sometimes we have to admit in those moments that we've made mistakes along the way, right? Like this. Anybody recognize this? This is like 1997, 1999. Any Coke fans out there? Coca-Cola? Who liked the new Coke in 19... No, like, like if, if you're not familiar with this, like in, in the 99th year of Coke's existence, they decided, even though they were beating Pepsi in every category, they decided we're going to make a major change to our product, and they rolled out new Coke, and it was a disaster, Right? It was a disaster. That's what everybody says. It was horrible. They changed their product. They changed their purpose. And the fans rose up and said, no, 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 this is horrible. You need to stop this right now. And Coke listened to them. And they went back and they admitted, yeah, maybe we made a mistake with this. Here's the reality. If we want to reboot in our lives, if we want to reboot, sometimes it takes us overcoming doubt and uncertainty and being willing to be 
repurposed. Don't miss this. If we want to reboot in our lives, if we want God to come in and to do a work in our lives, sometimes it takes us overcoming doubt and uncertainty and being willing to be repurposed. We have to be willing to be repurposed. And this is especially true when Jesus is involved in the conversation. Like business leaders across the country and around the world would say this is important on a business level. It is so much more important as when Jesus is involved when, it's, when we're talking about our spiritual lives. We met Paul uh, when his name is Saul in the New Testament for the first time in the book of Acts. And we've outlined that over the last couple of weeks. But, but what the reality is in Saul's life is he thinks that his life is on track. He thinks that things are going well for him, but in reality, he's about ready to implode in his life. He's about ready to, to have a disaster, and he's about to meet Jesus, and Jesus is about to take his life in a totally new direction, and we've talked about that refocus last week. And Saul, he, he thought he was living within the will of God, but he was far from the will of God, right? Like Saul thought that he had power and he had influence in the best possible way, but he was blinded to see what was really happening around him. He, he thought, Saul thought that he was moving up, but he was moving in the wrong direction. He was moving far from God. And Jesus stops him in his tracks on that road to Damascus. He stops him in his tracks, and he, he blinds him in that moment. And, and Jesus begins this process of totally rebooting his life. And this is what we talked about last week. He got a refocus in his life. His priorities shifted to the right direction. And by repurposing in Paul's, in, in Paul's life, in Saul's life, Jesus didn't just come in and say, you know what, we're just going to start over. He, he didn't come into Saul's life and say, you know what, we're just going to act like your past didn't happen and hope that people forget about it. He, Jesus didn't come in and just put the to- push the restart button and, and, and wipe everything clear. No, Jesus took, God took Paul's life. He took Paul's past and he used it for his glory. This is what we're going to look at this morning. Three things that God repurposed in Paul's life. First one is this. God repurposed Paul's plans. God repurposed Paul's plans. Let's look at Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 4. This is what Paul says, okay? Philippians chapter 3, verse 4. If anyone else thinks that he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more, Paul says. Circumcised on the eighth day, of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law, a Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. Here's what Paul is doing in this moment. He's saying, here's my Jewish card, okay? Here are my credentials. Here are the things that I have accomplished in my life. This is the status that I have. This is what Paul is saying here. He was the poster child for Judaism. He was the perfect candidate. He, he was circumcised on the eighth day. Here's what this means. Like, not only was he dedicated to this, but his parents were as well. They were dedicated to following the law to the T. His parents made sure that that took place. His name, let's look at his name. His name was Saul. He was named after the first king of Israel who also was in the family line of Benjamin. It was a family name. Saul got a family name. And even though he was born a Roman citizen, he was still a Hebrew of Hebrews. He he had everything going for him. Saul did. He was a Pharisee. He was an expert of the law. He, he knew it well. He could quote it. He, he knew it backwards and forwards. He had zeal. He was persecuting the church uh, actively and passionately. He, he was blameless under the law. And he had all of these things going for him. Saul had all of these things. He had these plans. He learned from the best teacher. He was rising to the top. And this is what he says in Galatians chapter 1. He said, I advanced in Judaism beyond many contemporaries among my people because I was extremely zealous for the, trans, for the traditions of my ancestors. He had plans. Saul had plans. He knew where he was going. Maybe, we don't may, maybe understand that fully. We probably don't have the map of where Saul was going in his life. Maybe he wanted to just rise up. Maybe he wanted to be a leader. Maybe he wanted to be noticed. Maybe I don't know what it was. But he meets Jesus on that road to Damascus. And things change in his life. 
He, he meets Jesus and, and his plans are repurposed. Everything that he had done, everything that he had accomplished, everything that he had learned got reprioritized, got refocused in his life. Everything was given a new direction, was given a new purpose in his life. And Jesus didn't just take all those old things from his old life and throw them away. No, he repurposed them for his plans and for his glory. This is what, again, Paul says, Romans chapter 15. Nevertheless, I have written to remind you more boldly on some points because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. Don't miss this. Serving as a priest of God's good news. My purpose is that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Jesus repurposed Paul's life to make him a priest for the Gentiles which in the first century around Judaism was just a foreign thing. Like, this was God's plan. Let's, that word Gentile, you know, we throw it out there a lot. We read it throughout the New Testament quite a bit, but a lot of times it goes undefined. So let me define it for you. A few different definitions of what the word Gentile means. Uh, one definition you can find is heathen. Like, Gentile means heathens, Okay. Somewhat acceptable, but still pretty vague. Another, trend, or another definition is pagan, a little less common. Uh, the most common definition of Gentile is a non-Jewish person. Gentile was a person who was not born Jewish. And understand where the world was in the first century. Like, there were multiple, there was a plurality of, of countries and cultures like it wasn't just the Jewish people and the Gentiles. There was a plurality of them. One of those cultures and those countries was the Jewish nation. And everyone else, the Jewish people referred to as Gentiles. Understand how Jewish individuals thought of themselves. We are Jewish. Everybody else is not us. They get lumped into one, into one category. That's what is going on here. The Jews are, are having this thought process that we are so special that we have a word uh, that is for everyone else who is not us, Gentile. And Saul would have been proud of this. Like before his meeting with Jesus, he would have been the one that was sitting there thanking God that he wasn't born a Gentile. Thank you, God, that I'm a Jewish man. And so you have Saul here, who is the Hebrew of Hebrews, you're, you're, and, and Jesus says you're going to be a priest for the Gentiles. God is, is taking him in a completely different direction than his life was going originally. And God says, you're going to go and to, you're going to go to these people that you were fighting against, that you, that you dislike, that you look down on. You're going to go to these people that you have despised for being non-Jewish, that you've hated because they don't follow the law as you do. And God says, you're going to make sure that they know that they are accepted by God because of what Jesus has done on the cross. This is now Paul's command. This is, God, this is Paul's purpose. God repurposed Paul's plans towards this. Number two, God also repurposed Paul's prestige. God repurposed Paul's prestige. He was a man of influence. Don't miss this. Like Paul was, when he was Saul before his meeting with Jesus, he was not a nobody, okay? He was somebody. He was well known. It, we, we first meet him at the stoning of Stephen, and what do we see him doing at that? He's, he's standing to the side as men are, are throwing these rocks, killing Stephen, and, and, and Saul is on the side holding coats, right? He's holding everybody's coats. And at first glance, that can look at kind of in our society as, well, he's just kind of a nobody, like he's the coat check guy, right? But let's understand the culture. He was actually in a higher position than the people throwing the rocks because now he can approve of this, and he doesn't have to get his hands dirty. Saul, in this moment, was the one at this very young age, he was giving the approval, he was giving the okay, he, he was saying, yes, let's do this to this man, Stephen, by stoning him. He was, he was the one approving this. He had prestige. He, he was a leader. He was known by people around him. Saul was known by the people on both sides of this. The Christians knew him, obviously, because he was hunting them down. He was trying to kill them. He was trying to wipe them off the earth. And he was also known in the Jewish culture as well, as a leader, of, as a Pharisee. Jesus took Paul's plans, and he took Paul's uh, prestige and influence, and he repurposed it 
for the kingdom of God. And he, Paul began to influence the church for years and years to come. As a priest to the Gentiles, Paul was given a special opportunity that probably nobody else had during the first century. This is what we read, Ephesians chapter 3. Paul writes this again, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ on behalf of you Gentiles, you have heard, haven't you, about the administration of God's grace that he gave to me for you? The mystery was made known to me by revelation, and I have briefly written above. By reading this, you are able to understand my insight about the mystery of the Messiah. This was not made known to people in other generations as it is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The Gentiles are co-heirs. Don't miss it. What, what is Paul saying here? The Gentiles are co-heirs, members of the same body and partners of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. This is Paul saying these words to Gentiles. The Gentiles are fellow heirs. And Paul got to share this mystery that has never been shared with them before. Paul is the one that gets to take this to him. The Jews thought that they were God's chosen special people, and at some level they were, but they just didn't have a full, complete understanding of what that really meant. Like they didn't understand that, yes, they are the chosen people in the sense that they were the ones to usher in the Messiah into the world for the whole world to receive. That's the part that they missed. They thought that they were God's chosen people, and this was just for them. They thought that they were so special that, that they gave everyone this not Jewish name that means not Jewish. That's, that's where their mentality was. But Paul says here, the mystery is this. The mystery is this. Everybody gets to hear about Jesus. Everybody gets to hear about Jesus. Everybody gets to participate in salvation. And who better? Church, who better to bring this message than the Hebrew of Hebrews, right? Who better to bring this message to, uh, of salvation to all people than the man who has an influence and prestige on both sides of this, right? Like, like, who better to bring this message to the Gentiles and say, I know what you've been told because I've been the one saying it, but I was wrong, Paul says. Who better to, to bring this message of, of how they are equal in the, in the sight of God. And there is no difference here than the man with that much, in, much influence in both the Jewish culture and in the Gentile culture. Paul used his prestige. He used his influence to combat so many different things. One of those things was legalism in the, in the early church. Uh, early on in the church, legalism started creeping its way in. And, and what we read about in Acts chapter 15 is that some well-meaning Christians began believing that you first had to become Jewish before you could become a Christian. And this is what it says, chapter 15, verse 1 and 2 it says, some men came down from Judea and began to teach the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom prescribed by Moses, you cannot be saved. That's the whole, you need to become Jewish before you become Christian. Verse 2, but after Paul and Barnabas had engaged them in serious argument, it wasn't all like, oh, hey, we need to talk to you about this, and it was all like easy. Like, it was a serious argument, it says, and debate. The church arranged for Paul and Barnabas and some others of them to go up to the apostles and elders in Jerusalem concerning this controversy. And Paul goes on in Galatians to outline this a little bit further, and he talks about how he has to confront Peter. Peter, the one who walked with Jesus. Peter, the one that Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church. That Peter, that's the one that, that Paul is confronting here about this, saying that this is not the way it's supposed to be. Paul combated legalism. And here's the thing, over the last 2,000 years, we've been using Paul's writings throughout the New Testament to combat legalism that creeps its way into the church over the last 2,000 years. And so, God repurposes First, Paul's plans. Second, he repurposes his prestige and his influence. Thirdly, God repurposed Paul's past. Paul repurposed Paul's past. Excuse me, God repurposed Paul's past. Say that ten times fast. I cannot. 
It's hard. It's, here it is. It's hard to wrap our minds around this, isn't it? Like, it's hard to wrap our minds around the transition and all that has taken place in Paul's life. I mean, think about this. This is a man who was standing approving of the stoning of Stephen, okay? That happened. This is a man who was getting papers in order to seek out Christians in order to throw them in prison and kill them. This is that man. How do you go from that to uh, somebody who gets up in the morning to preach the gospel to anybody who will hear it? How do you go from wanting to kill Christians to being a man that wants to spread the gospel of Jesus to anybody who will hear it? How do you do that and not feel like, like the worst person in the world? How do, you, how do you get up in the morning and not feel horrible? How do, you not, how do you recover from that? How do you not feel riddled with guilt and shame inside of you? And you read some of these passages, how he was the Hebrew of Hebrews and how well-respected he was and how he was moving up and everything. And, and you just have to think about that and go, he lost everything in this. Like Paul, when he, when he changed and he started following Jesus, he, he had to have lost everything. I mean, think about his family. Like, how did people respond to this? How did, how did his parents respond? And of course, we don't necessarily know. But you have to imagine, if they were strong in the Jewish faith, that they would have abandoned him. Like, that would have been the end for, for him. And surely his friends would have cut ties with him. The teachers that he had learned from, that he had looked up to, had probably had nothing to do with him beyond this. And so you have that side of it where he loses everything from his previous life, but at least in the first few years in his new life of following Jesus, this new life that you're going into, everybody knows who you are because you were the one trying to kill them. Do you think that relationship was just great off the bat? I mean, I doubt it, right? I, I, doubt, I doubt that that's the case. Like everyone who you want to know and you want to build relationship with, they're all Christians, the ones that you're called to minister to, and, and they have to be at some level a little bit afraid of you. They have to be a little bit of sure, unsure of what's going on. And so you have to feel like you are totally alone in this. Like he's lost everything. He has nobody. He has nothing. But God took Paul's past and he used it for his own glory and his own future. And this is what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1. In the midst of this, he says, I give thanks to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he considered me faithful, appointing me to the ministry, one who was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an arrogant man. And I received mercy because I acted out of ignorance and unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and true and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to, what? To save sinners. And I am the worst of them. But I received mercy for this reason, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Here's what Paul is saying. This is the most important thing. Regardless of what else has happened, Jesus came to save sinners in which I am the worst of them all. And if Jesus came to save me, Paul says, with the past I have, there is hope for everyone. There is hope for everyone. Jesus takes Paul's past and he repurposes it for a better future. And hear this. If you don't hear anything else, hear this. We can all approach the throne of God with confidence because of people like Paul who showed us that Jesus died for everyone. Jesus died for everyone. And we can approach the throne confidently because of that. Paul uses part of his life as and is, is an example for the rest of us to see. God repurposes Paul. He took Paul's uh, past. He took his plans. He, he took his prestige and his, and his influence, and he turned it into a beautiful thing that benefited the kingdom of God for eternity. And here's what happens when God comes in and he takes a hold of your past and of your influence and of your plans. He can repurpose it into something beautiful for the kingdom of God. We see it in Paul's life. We see it in so many other people's lives, and we can see it in our lives as well. 
Jesus wants to come into our lives and do something amazing. He wants to make something beautiful happen in our lives and in our homes and in our workplaces, in our city, in people's lives around us. He wants to come in and repurpose us for his glory. He wants to take whatever plans that you have and that you have had, and he wants to use it for his glory. He wants to take our prestige and our influence and use it for his glory. He wants to take our past, whatever it is, however dirty, however messed up and blemished and abused that it is, and he wants to use it for our, for, excuse me, for his glory. He wants to take it all, and he wants to wrap it up in his mercy and grace like what Paul talked about, and he wants to use it for his glory. If we're willing Jesus will partner with us to reboot our lives, to start us fresh, to start us new with a new purpose, with a new plan. So practically, like what we have been for the last couple of weeks, we just want to ask a few questions. What does this look like per- practically for us? So these questions are basically the same every week, and we're going to continue asking them, but four basic things. What is something ambitious that God wants to do in your life? that you've been resistant to? What is, what is something ambitious that God wants to, to do in your heart, in your life, in people's lives around you that you've been holding off on? What is something, secondly, contagious that spreads this to other people around you? Number three, what is something courageous God is calling you to sacrifice right now? And number four, what is something outrageous that changes the world because we allow God to come into our lives and to speak and to work and to reboot our lives. Church, Christ came to save sinners. Christ came to save sinners, and we have a part in that. What is your part? Church, pray with me this week. What is God calling me to do? Who is God calling me to build relationships with? What is God calling me to sacrifice, and how is God calling me to impact others. Let's allow God to have, to do a reboot in our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, I'm just so thankful for the life of Paul that we get to dive into for these several weeks, and, and I'm so thankful that we get to step back and we get to look at the change that you did in his life, the miraculous change that you did in, in Paul's life and then ask these questions, God, what are you trying to do in our lives? What do you desire to do in our lives? What, what plans in our, in our past, and what, uh, what things in our past, what influence in our lives do you want to take and use for your glory? God, I pray for the strength and the courage for us to be listening for that, to be seeing your leading, and then to step out and to follow wherever you lead us, God. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for all that he's done for us. Thank you for your love and your grace. And it is in in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.